Now, politicians here in Britain may be busy enjoying themselves at their respective conferences, but out in the real world, Europe is facing financial meltdown. In an interview in The Spectator magazine, the Foreign Secretary William Hague repeated his claim that the euro was like a burning building with no exits. In order to try to find a way out of the crisis, German Chancellor Angela Merkel has just overwhelmingly won a vote in Parliament to approve new powers to the EU's main bailout fund called the European Financial Stability Facility. This was overhauled back in July and consists of a commitment to boost bailout guarantees to 440 billion euros. The hope being that it will be enough to calm the markets and help restore confidence. However, many commentators have argued that given the current climate, much more will be needed in the long run. Also this week, the Eurozone countries agreed a deal that would see private lenders write off 20% off their loans to Greece. Although it's believed a plan to allow Greece to default on around 50% of its debt is also on the cards. Yesterday, the head of the European Commission, Manuel Barroso, warned that Europe was facing its greatest challenge, but said he believed Greece would stay in the Eurozone. However, Nick Clegg will later today warn European governments that the EU would rupture if the Eurozone countries make decisions without consulting governments outside the single currency. Well, I'm joined now from Strasbourg by the Conservative MEP Daniel Hannan and here in the studio by Katinka Barish of the Centre for European Reform. Starting with you, Katinka, so she's won that vote overwhelmingly. Does this mean the end of the crisis for Germany? No, absolutely not. It doesn't mean the end of the euro crisis, that's for sure, because... Although we're just passing what's been agreed in July, actually the real debate is again already about what are we going to do next, how are we going to do, have a bigger bailout fund. And it certainly isn't the end of the political debate in Germany, um, how, how much Germany wants to make available to help its neighbours, what is Germany's new role in the European Union and well, so forth. I mean, it seems everyone sees Germany's, if it's new at all, as the sort of powerhouse of Europe that they have to lead the way. And there's been criticism that Angela Merkel has drawn dragged her feet, maybe politically, because it's very difficult for her. How do you think she's handled this whole crisis? She's handled it in a very Merkel sort of way. Yeah. Angela Merkel was never a leader. She's always been a cautious person. In the beginning, we liked her for it. You know, she was a consensus maker. She was good at knocking heads together, but she was never a leader. By the same token, the Germans have very little experience, post-war experience with leadership because their entire post-war period is one where they just neatly fitted into European integration and NATO and they weren't supposed to have an independent thinking, uh, an independent foreign policy and certainly no leadership. So all of a sudden they find themselves in that situation and it's slow, it's awkward. They're not, you know, they're too slow to, to do this. But, you know, they're trying to catch up all the time. And is it, is it right that the Germans should be the ones, bearing in mind they are doing better relatively economically, shouldn't they be the ones to lead the bailout? I mean, they benefit from the Eurozone. Why shouldn't they be the ones that pay the most and lead it from the front? But they are paying the most and they're trying to lead from <laughs> the front. So it's not that they're not trying. They're not doing as well as the financial markets and, and commentators would like them to do. But they're tr in, in their eyes, they're obviously trying to do what is feasible for them both financially and politically. And as I said, this vote today in the Bundestag is only one more step in, 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 a, in a much longer journey that we still have to take. But Daniel Hannan, um, thank you for joining us. What do you think should happen now? We've reached this sort of milestone, and in Angela Merkel's um, perspective, she's passed it. So that's, has it put off, if you like, any more decisions that need to be made about Greece or, or any of the other uh, countries that are vulnerable? No. As Katinka just said, the crisis has already moved on. Uh, the talk now is of expanding the available resources from the 440 billion to this almost incredible sum of 2 trillion euros. Mm. And this is going to be done by borrowing. So we're, we're treating the debt crisis with a massive increase in debt. N now, two questions immediately arise. First of all, who is going to guarantee a sum that large, 2 trillion euros? The, the answer on paper is the ECB. But the European Central Bank has been buying up so much junk debt from stricken Eurozone economies that it is already, on most definitions, a bad bank. So the reality is that the people standing behind this new debt are the taxpayers of Greece, Italy, Spain, Ireland, Portugal. In other words, the, the debtors are the same as the guarantors. But Second question, who are we going to borrow it from? Where are you going to get two trillion 
euros at a time like this. If somebody had it lying around, don't you think they'd have spent it by well, now? I, I, We're I, borrowing it, of course, from our children and our grandchildren. Well, except, Daniel Hunt, I suppose what they would argue is what is the alternative if you don't shore up these countries at this stage, even if you have to, as you painted, borrow, the risk of these countries defaulting and the contagion that may spread would expose our banks, for example, to great debt, certainly in places like Spain and Italy. And that is even worse than borrowing, even at high interest rates, um, because it will cost us more in the long run. No, it isn't. And the metaphor you use of contagion is a very interesting one. Uh, the way to prevent contagion is through quarantine. What the EU is doing is the opposite. It is taking the finances of perfectly healthy countries and degrading them by making them liable for other people's loans. You say, what's the alternative? The alternative is to let each country pursue a monetary policy determined by its own okay. conditions and needs. Plainly, it's in the interest of the peripheral countries to be able to export, to price their way back into the market. Plainly, it's in the interest of the core countries to be uh, let off this enormous tax rise that's being proposed. The only reason why that isn't happening is because people are trying to save face because they've got so much tied up politically in the Euro project yeah. and they're expecting their peoples to pay an extraordinary price for it. Dan, um, Katinka, what do you say to that, that actually now is the time to draw the line? We shouldn't be throwing good money after bad. Countries should be allowed to default and have their own monetary policy. Um, that's a very interesting point and I just spent this morning with a Greek analyst and university professor who made the point to me very clearly that he and the majority of the Greek people don't actually believe that leaving the euro is at all a solution to their problems. They just did a poll. 66% of the Greeks don't want to leave the euro. What would happen then, obviously, they would have to massively default both on their public and their private debt because you can't repay massive euro debts in a devalued drachma. I suppose what you would have say is what about the healthy countries like Germany and Britain that suffer? Do we care enough about what happens to Greece and, and the Greek people? Obviously... The, the Greek austerity program now has become counterproductive mm. in the sense that it's strangling the economy and you can't squeeze any more tax money out of an economy that is shrinking three, four years in a row. But what is right is that Greek, uh, Greece and some other European countries have to implement very deep reforms. The same applies to Germany. So this is not, not only a, a problem of the periphery. Um, but these are long-term programs. So the, thing, the, the, the big problem do, that we have at the moment is how do we keep the euro together um, so that we can implement these long-term problems. But I don't believe for one second that splitting up the euro is, is a solution for, for the structural problems that we have in much of Europe. And, and nor does Nick Clegg, um, Daniel Hannan. I mean, Nick Clegg has said, you know, we stand shoulder to shoulder with the eurozone. Financial crisis, it shouldn't be used as an excuse to create divisions. We've got to go ahead. He even went as far as saying, actually, Actually, they shouldn't be making agreements within the Eurozone that don't count us that are outside. He is almost saying we have to go along, we have to stick together, um, even if it means Manuel Barroso's plan of further integration is the way it goes. I suspect that Cleggie, who is an old friend of mine, is <laughs> uh, auditioning for his next job as the British nominee to the European Commission. Yes, but you're not the first person to say I mean, look, It is obviously in Britain's interest to have prosperous and stable countries on our doorstep. Nobody is arguing with that. The Eurozone takes around 40% of our exports. It is plainly in our interest to have those countries growing. That is not the same as keeping the Euro together. And when it becomes clear that the price for keeping the Euro together is permanent deflation, poverty and emigration for the southern countries and permanent wealth transfers for the northern countries so that both lots are growing more slowly than they otherwise would, that is not in our interest or in theirs. Now, they can make that mistake if they want, what they shouldn't do is send us the bill. We have no interest in making them pursue a policy that is bad for them Daniel, and bad for us. Very briefly before we go, what about this transaction tax that's been talked about, the Tobin tax? Um, what is your view as far as that's concerned? Because so many European transactions, of course, are carried out here in the UK, aren't they? Right. The transaction tax would raise something like 50 billion, of which something like 40 billion would come from London. In other words, we are being stuck with the bill to prop up a currency which we declined to join. This is not our problem. We should say very clearly, we kept the pound. Uh, raise the money another way if you're insisting on keeping the euro together. Or take our advice and let each country pursue a policy dictated by its own conditions and needs. Okay. Daniel Hannan in Strasbourg, Katinka Barrett here. Thank you very much.